Well, perfect. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the final week of Boulder County Senior Law Day. It's the only time a week lasts a month, but it's, it's COVID time. Um, we are happy to present Navigating Social Security today with Erin B. Eastvet. Um, I will be introducing a little more about our speaker today, but we have a few housekeeping things we want to touch base with you folks on. Um, first of all, due to our virtual format, some things are a bit different this year. Uh, you should all know today's webinar is being recorded. The video will be available later on the Boulder County Senior Law Day website. I'll be posting that link in the chat in a few minutes. Uh, the host has muted all participants. Please remain on mute um, during the presentation. If you have questions in the presentation, uh, please feel free to type your questions into either the chat or the Q&A form um, on the, the bottom of your screens. Um, Ms. Eastbet has let us know that she is more than happy to take questions during the presentation, so that it is a little bit more free-flowing because she wants to make sure she gets to all the questions. Um, we have, after today, two more sessions of Boulder County Senior Law Day coming up this Thursday, October 1st. From noon to one, Kurt Hofgaard will be presenting on a state planning basic, uh, State Planning 101. Uh, it's going to be a great, great talk, uh, answering a lot of questions that I'm sure are on a lot of people's minds. And then at 1.15 next Thursday, uh, October 1st, we have the bonus session of estate planning train wrecks uh, presented by the attorneys of Lyon Gaddis. So I think that will be a lot of fun. Uh, you can sign up for these two webinars on our website. Oh no, and I'm so sorry to hear someone has black screen of death. Um, best I can say is, um, we can try to, uh, let me stop the share and reshare. Um, hopefully that has fixed it. If not, um, again, we will be presenting a lot of this auditorially as well, and I'll be posting links in the chat. Um, right now, the Ask the Lawyer program is just not gonna be possible to get a bunch of people in a, in a room together to, to ask questions. Uh, however, our platinum level sponsor, the Boulder County Bar Association, provides a free virtual legal clinic uh, where people can get that same service uh, just remotely over the phone. Uh, so just sign up for that. You can call the Boulder County Bar Association, 303-440-4758, or go to their website, www.boulder-bar.org. Uh, and I, again, will be posting that link in the chat in just a few minutes. Our Senior Law Day handbooks, um, we are offering that in a digital format at seniorlawhandbook.org. You can download it or you can just access it while looking at the website if you have internet access. Um, it's a really great way to access that resource. But if you want a paper copy, you can contact Erica Corson at the Boulder County Area Agency on Aging at 303-441-1170. We have a few copies um, in the paper version. Um, so that being said, we'd like to thank our sponsors. We are so grateful for them and we could not do this without them. So our talk today on Social Security um, is presented by Erin D. Eastvet. She is a staff attorney with Colorado Legal Services in the Health and Elder Law Unit in Denver. She received a bachelor's in political science from Agnes Scott College and a JD from the University of Colorado Law School. She is licensed to practice law in the state of Colorado and before the Federal District Court for the District of Colorado and the Ninth and Tenth Circuit Courts of Appeals. Ms. Eastbett has practiced primarily in the field of public benefit law and social security disability. Um, and I can say, having, having been a friend with Ms. Eastbett for several years, uh, she, there is no one on this planet who is more passionate about this subject matter. So I will turn it over to Erin to and 
uh, let you all just really enjoy her experience, uh, expertise. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Um, so, and thank you for that, that wonderful introduction. Um, let me just really quickly share my screen. Okay, so can, can folks on the call see my PowerPoint presentation? Okay. So, um, so my presentation is called Social Security Navigating the Maze. And then before I get too far into this, um, I know you can't see me. I'm not sure why my camera isn't working, but um, I um, am, but fortunately most of this will be, you know, as Brett said, you know, mostly auditory. Um, and as long as you can see my presentation, that's that's good. Um, so, so I always talk. The reason I I use the title "Navigating the Maze" is because Social Security can be extremely confusing and frustrating. And so my goal today is to just kind of break it down so that it just makes a little bit more sense for you guys. Um, and as I said, I will try to be um, monitoring uh, questions as we go forward. Give me one second here, just to. Okay, so, okay. So there are several different types of social security benefits um, and they fall into a few main different categories. So you have retirement benefits, which is what I think people are most familiar with. Um, spousal benefits, which um, basically if you don't have enough earnings, and we'll get into that issue a little bit later, but if you don't have enough earnings to um, If you don't have enough earnings to um, obtain Social Security on your own record, um, you can sometimes get it on a spouse's record. Um, and survivor's benefits is the same as that, only this is more widows and widowers benefits. So it's the same concept, only it's after your spouse is deceased. Um, and then the last two categories I'll talk about are Social Security disability and supplemental security income, both of which can be used um, as disability benefits, but um, aren't necessarily um, social, social, pardon me, supplemental security income is a little bit broader, and I'll get into that in a minute. So just a brief history of social security. Um, I have the frequent Roosevelt quote up here because this was basically a program, um, a program to try to it was part of the New Deal. It was one of the many programs trying to get America out of the Depression. And so Social Security was created on August 14th, 1935. Um, and at that time, it only covered retirement. Um, there wasn't nearly as many benefits as there are today. Um, you get, um, so survivors and spousal benefits were added first in 1939. And then there were no disability benefits until um, 1956, and um, the Supplemental Security Income, which is mainly, mainly a means-based program, um, didn't really um, start until 1974 um, during kind of the, the war on poverty period. Um, so, so we're going to talk a little bit about work records today, and most Social Security programs are programs that you pay into from your payroll taxes when you're working. Um, so as you pay in as you pay in with your payroll taxes, you, you get a certain number of what are called, you know, um, work credits. And so you'd have to earn $1,410 for a work credit um, up to four per year. Um, and you earn up to four per year. And once you have 40 work credits, then you're looking at being eligible for things like retirement and disability that are, that are work-based. Sorry about that. Okay. And so reducing Social Security benefits. Um, and this goes into if you're, if you're working during uh, getting Social Security, basically you have $1 reduced for every, um, for every $2 that you're over the limit. Um, and the real reason I put this slide in here is people wonder about their retirement age. That's one question you hear a lot with Social Security is when am I going to um, be fully eligible for Social Security? Um, if you were born before 1954, it's 66, um, but that's been staggered. Um, that's being staggered to be later and later. Um, and so, um, 
as you can see, you know, it, it gets staggered with, with birth, birth dates through the 50s, and then 1960 and after, you're looking at a full retirement age of 67 years. Now, it is possible to take early retirement, but that would reduce your monthly benefit. And so this is the age, depending on the year you were born, that you would need to retire at to, to receive your full retirement benefit. Now, this is one thing that, you know, I do want to just talk, talk about really quickly. Um, how much will you be getting in benefits? And you don't need to worry too much about the formulas on this slide, but the main point is that it depends on how much you made when you were working. Um, so they look at the highest 35 years of earnings and use that to determine your uh, Social Security benefit amount. That's why one person on retirement may get, as my example shows, you know, $1,200 a month and another person may only get 800 um, because the, the person who gets 800 probably didn't have as high of paying jobs or maybe had more years out of the workforce. And so, um, and so their monthly benefit would be lower. And I just wanna highlight this and I'm gonna come back to it um, at the end. Um, www.socialsecurity, uh, pardon me, .ssa.gov has, has a way to open what's called My Account, and that's how you can get your earnings record. You can see what your monthly benefit's going to be. Basically, you can get to all of your important information um, from, from your My, so My Social Security account. Um, so I would really encourage people to, to set those up. Okay, and so I want to talk a little bit here about the interplay between Social Security retirement and SSI. So, social, so supplemental security income, um, basically, can, you can get that in one of two circumstances. It can serve as retirement or it can serve as disability. And what it is, is basically a program for lower income people who don't have as much work history. Um, so if you're, as I was saying before, if you maybe haven't worked a lot or if you've worked in a lot of low paying jobs, and your retirement is less than basically $803 a month, you can get supplemental security income. And even if your SSI benefit is only a dollar a month, you'll get Medicaid. And that's one of the key things here. So if you look at the, the work-based programs, the earnings-based programs, um, being in those would come with, with eligibility for Medicare in certain circumstances. Um, basically, if you're over 65, you would be eligible for Medicare. And if you're getting the disability uh, supplemental, pardon me, Social Security Disability Insurance or SSDI, you would also get Medicare along with that. Um, now with the SSI, um, that would come with Medicaid because Medicaid, again, Medicare is a, an earnings-based paying into the system type program and SSI is, an, is a means-based program or a need-based program. So. Um, that's why um, if, you're, if your retirement benefit is low, making sure you apply for SSI is key as well. And um, because even if you're only, what it'll basically do is supplement, what's, su what supplemental security income will do is supplement your income up to that 803, and then you also have Medicaid eligibility. Even if, say, your, your retirement is, let's just say, $800 a month, even if you're only getting those $3 in SSI, you'll still get that Medicaid eligibility along with them. So it's really important to make sure you apply for SSI if you're eligible. Um, so I wanna dig into this a little bit more because people think of Social Security and Medicare as kind of going hand in hand. Um, so when you turn 65 is when you become eligible for Medicare. Um, but like I showed you on that other slide, some people's full retirement age is 66 or 67. And so when you turn 65, you're going to want to apply for Medicare, you know, as soon as, um, as soon as you can in order to avoid late enrollment penalties. Um, basically, um, looking at, you know, I think it's the three months before your, yeah, it's the three months before your 65th birthday, the month of your 65th birthday, and then the three months afterwards, that's the time period to sign up for Medicare. Um, so you'll want to contact your social security office once you get to that age um, and they can help you apply for Medicare. But if you don't apply during that time period um, and, you, and you sign up later, you can actually get late enrollment penalties that increase your monthly premium. So you want to, of course, avoid that. If 
factors reducing so, um, before I go into factors reducing social security retirement I'm just going to pause for a minute and see if anyone has any questions that they haven't put in the chat so go ahead and, and do that and put those in the Q&A if you could And Erin, we do have a question. Yeah, I do see that. I was just reading it, yeah. Um, so, so the question is, just for everyone's benefit, I retired with PARA after 22 years of service with the state of Colorado at age 66. Of course, my social security benefit has been reduced by the windfall elimination provision. Um, <clears throat> And I was actually going to get into that in a couple of minutes, but we'll go ahead and address that now. Yes, if you have a government pension and you're claiming benefits on your own record, um, in fact, let me just slip ahead a couple of slides here so that we can so that we can go ahead and talk about that, Sherry. Okay, so okay, so I am on that slide. So if you're collecting both a pension and social security on your own work record, um, you are subjected to what's called the windfall elimination provision. Um, what's called the windfall elimination provision because Sherry's exactly right. If you've got a pension in, additional, in addition to your social security retirement, it will reduce that monthly benefit. Um, if you're collecting a pension from your work and you're getting, for example, spousal or um, widow's benefits or collecting on another person's record in some of the ways we'll talk about in a minute, again, you're gonna have basically the same thing, but it's called a government pension offset. Now, if you're collecting both the social security and um, the pension on another person's record, let's say, for example, that you were a homemaker and your husband worked or your wife worked and um, was able to um, earn both a pension and social security, if you collect both of those on your spouse's record, then those windfall provisions aren't gonna kick in. Um, but, if it's, but if one of those things is on your own record, um, if, you're, if you're collecting a pension on your own record, unfortunately, that will happen. Um, Glenn, um, I just wanna read Glenn's, Glenn's comment to the folks who aren't looking at the, at the Q&A. Um, it says here, you should, um, you should apply for Medicare three months before your 65th birthday in order to get through the, t the process in a timely manner, my personal experience. Absolutely. Um, and that, that does touch on something. I know I'm, I'm going to be giving you guys some practical tips. One of them is definitely, you know, start whatever you're trying to do, you know, start it as early as possible. Um, you know, start, start doing that as early as possible. Um, because social security is very slow they're very understaffed and i you know sometimes you have to send them documents multiple times so earlier is always better so thank you for making that point glenn give me one second while i look at sherry's question okay um okay so sherry says mike my husband, who was fully under Social Security throughout his working years, divorced me after 30 years of marriage. Three years ago, I was three years ago. I was told that if I try to collect under his account, that will also be subjected to the to the windfall elimination provision, and that's correct um, because um, you would have to be basically you would have to be collecting that pension and the Social Security both on his record. Um, and because that pension is on your record, you're, that's correct. Unfortunately, um, if the if the pension is on your record, that that's correct. That even though it's his social security, you will still be subjected to that windfall elimination provision. Um, and Erin, we have another uh, question in the chat. Okay. Um, and I'll read it out loud just to, to make life a little easier. Thank you. Um, so if I get $700 a month from Social Security and I'm paying $130 Medicare, 
if I applied for SSI, that payment would be eliminated with Medicaid. And then following up, I must note, I'm paying Medicare, but at age 67, I have not started Social Security benefits yet. Okay, so, so that's something that actually I didn't put in this presentation, but it's something that's a little bit related to the interplay between SSI and Medicaid. So, so you're right. You would if you if because your your um, monthly benefit is below 803, you would get Medicaid. But in um, you would get Medicaid, and that would potentially cover that um, that premium that you referred to. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but but she said she was paying um, basically about $130. That was that the Part B premium? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming okay. that's what, what the question is. Yeah. And then so, we have so I was just gonna say, um, so yeah, if you apply for Medicaid, I mean, you should be able to get those covered. I'm trying to remember in that situation. Um, Um, so if you have the SSI and you get the Medicaid, you probably wouldn't need to apply for what's called a Medicare Savings Program. And um, what a Medicare Savings Program is, if you have Medicaid, uh, pardon me, let's say let's say you have Medicare, but you're not poor enough to get Medicaid, but you still um, are below 100% of the poverty line, which there is space there between obviously that 803 and the about 1100 that's the poverty line. In that case, you would want to go to your Medicaid office and apply, and apply for what's called a Medicare Savings Program. And what that is, is basically depending on the type of program and, and how low your income is, you can qualify for cost sharing. So you can have Medicaid paying your Part B premium or folks who have a Part A premium can get that paid. Um, you can have people paying your, um, uh, rather you can have Medicaid pay your deductible and you can have Medicare, uh, Medicaid pay those 20% those co-pays that Medicare doesn't cover. So that actually is a good point to bring up. There are um, Medicaid programs that can help you even if you don't qualify for Medicaid if you don't get the SSI. So let me just take a minute. So, so Kathleen's um, so uh, so Kathleen has asked a very a very good question. She says the win the para and SS windfall provision. How is that fair? If I paid into both systems especially as a single person who will need both systems? And the short answer is, I don't think it is fair. Um, th that is a recurring theme with, with unfortunately, with Social Security. Um, you know, the issue of, I don't, I honestly don't think a lot of the monthly benefits are enough for someone to live on. I see a lot of clients um, in the health elder unit who are on Social Security, even if it's retirement or disability and are still on other public benefits. So, I mean, that's the, the short answer to your question, Kathleen, is that's not fair. Unfortunately, that is the way the system is set up. Um, okay, Linda says, we, my husband and I both retired under PARA. We've paid into Social Security all of our lives as well. He passed away two years ago. I turned 60 next year. Can I get Social Security on his record after 60 years old and then on mine at 67? Or does it all fall under the windfall provision? So as long as you're, so, so that windfall provision is going to kick in if the, if the pension is on your record. If you're using your para, then that windfall, and actually, let me correct myself. So, so because it's para, it's the state of Colorado, that's going to be a government pension offset. Um, so if you're collecting the pension from your work and Social Security on his record, that is going to kick in. Um, so that, that is how that would work. Okay, so Sherry says, what's the difference between WEP and GPO? Wouldn't I be collecting my pension from my work and trying to apply for my ex-husband's SS under his record? Absolutely. So there are certain jobs, there are certain jobs that, um, because they pay into a government pension, for example, like teachers, people like that, they don't necessarily pay into Social Security. And so what the, what the situation there would be is say you have a job um, for, let's just use para. Let's just say you're a Colorado State employee and you're paying into para. You're paying it, so you're paying into para. You don't have enough earnings to qualify for Social Security because you didn't pay enough into the system because you were a Colorado employee your entire career and all those earnings went into para and they didn't go into Social Security. So you have no Social Security. 
but your husband was was a private employee and he um excuse me so you didn't pay into social security so you only have that government pension but your husband paid into social security in your case um and and he does have the social security so you'd want to collect from your pension and his social security and that's when the gpo kicks in the main difference here is um the, ma the main difference is whether or not you yourself paid into Social Security, which is what you're looking at with the windfall elimination provision, or whether you had a government job your entire career, um, whether, whether you had a government job your entire career um, and you're just collecting your spouse's Social Security. Okay, what is para? That's a good, that's a good question because you have to, the problem with lawyers is we do talk in acronyms. Um, and I can't, and I apologize, I don't remember exactly what PARA stands for, but it's basically the government pension or government retirement program set up for employees of the state of Colorado. So that's what PARA is. If you're, if you're a private employee in the state of Colorado, you're going to be paying into Social Security with your payroll taxes. If you are a, um, if you work for the state of Colorado, you're going to be getting PARA. Sherry says, I paid into Social Security for about 20 years, into PARA for 22 years. Yeah, I mean, so this goes back to the question we had earlier about fairness, right? You know, if you've paid into both of these systems your entire career, why should you have to take this windfall provision? Um, and the short answer is that's how the regulations are set up. Um, but I agree with the comments that are being made in the chat that this isn't necessarily the most fair way to do things. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, if I retire from my government job and I work another job until I'm 70, that takes out taxes and pays enough to pass the, to bypass the windfall elimination provision. So, um, I'm just thinking about that. So yeah, if you have both pensions, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I guess you could end up with the, um, I guess you could end up with with a windfall elimination provision if you were getting both. I mean, that's an interesting question. If you have a government pension and Social Security, how that would play out. I may look into that a little bit and get an answer to Brett for you um, and, and, and um, see how that would play out. Um, have there been any legal precedents or activist movements to fight this windfall provision? I'm not sure, Kathleen. Um, I'm honestly not sure. I can certainly again look into that for you, but um, that's a good question and, and there is definitely an argument to be made for that because if you've paid into both systems for your entire life, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, I'm sure Social Security would tell you this is a budgetary constraint issue, but I actually agree with you that these windfall of the nation provisions shouldn't kick in for people who, you know, who basically do both. um and jason crow has a motion um i'm not sure what the what the question is there um what what they what they may be saying is that that jason crow is is trying to challenge this so if that's the case we'll just have to to keep an eye on that um and and hopefully maybe get some progress to be made on that Okay, so not seeing any more questions at this moment, and please keep your questions coming, but not seeing any questions at this moment, I'm gonna go ahead and move into the issue of survivor benefits. So um, up to 100% of the spouse's benefits. So this is what we were talking about with widows and widowers benefits. Um, it could be less, um, and it can be as low as 71.5%. Um, and it does depend on how old, how old you are and how old your spouse was when they, when they passed away. Um, so just just a note there that age matters for that. And spousal benefits are for a spouse who is still living. Um, and you can get up to 50% of the spouse's benefit if you're at least 62 and if your spouse is receiving a benefit. I mean, this is one of the cases where a work record is not necessary. Um, however, if you're caring for a minor child or a disabled adult child who's receiving benefits, you can get 75% of the benefit. 
And then I just want to briefly talk about children obtaining Social Security on the parent's record. So if you look at your earnings record, it'll mention two amounts, which one of which is the primary insurance amount or PIA, which I talked about earlier, and then you'll see the family maximum. And what the family maximum is, is the amount that you would be you and your children would be eligible for if you had dependent children. Um, and when something like that would kick in is if, you know, if you as the parent died, if you become disabled, if you're receiving SSDI, um, then, your, then your children would be eligible for those benefits that fall under the family maximum. And then if you're retired, your, your children can have some eligibility. So I just wanted to briefly touch on that. So before I jump into the more disability um, related programs, are there any more questions? Okay. Okay, so, so Jan is asking, you know, county employees also pay into PARA and SSA and we're told SSA will not be decreased. Sounds like this is incorrect information or there are different scenarios. Um, so what I would do if you have questions about what your benefits are gonna be is probably contact your social security office. Um, that would probably be the best way. Um, I mean, I might need a little bit more detail on that scenario, but, um, But um, I would, my short answer would be, you know, if you want to know what your monthly benefits are going to be or, their, or Social Security's best estimate when you retire, that probably the best thing to do would be to contact your local office. Um, and I will have a link for that later. Okay, so I'm ask, being asked to go back to spousal benefits. So just bear with me for a minute. Okay, so the spousal benefits are if your spouse is living and you're trying to get benefits on their record. Um, and you have to be at least 62 years old and your spouse um, has to be receiving a social security benefit. Now, the, the, the issue there is, um, so you don't have to have a work record for that. This is again, maybe a, a homemaker scenario where one spouse is staying home and the other spouse was working and the spouse is you know, retired. Um, the spouse who's retired and is collecting, um, collecting benefits, you can actually get um, up to 50% of that benefit. Um, you can actually get up to 50% of the benefit for yourself and you don't have to be working. Um, so if you have a, a more specific question about that, I'd be happy to answer it. Uh, so I have a question. Can you change from spousal to your own record at your retirement age? Yes, you can do that. And sometimes people do do that. Um, you know, it just depends on, you know, whether whether your monthly benefit is going to be higher, whether your that, part, that spousal benefit is going to be higher. What Social Security will usually do is let you take the higher of the two benefits. You can't take both, but usually you're going to end up with the higher of the two benefits in that situation. So Glenn says spousal benefits have exceptions and also time limitations on changing from collecting. So always check with an advisor. That is very good advice. Um, that is incredibly good advice. When you're dealing with social security, it's always good to try to, to try to get advice from, you know, some, sometimes, you know, whether you can get an attorney or whether you can, you know, work with an advocacy group in your area. Um, it's always good to, to, to have someone to work with um, when you're changing benefits. And Erin, I'm gonna pop in here because Boulder County has a really cool program called the Personal Finance Program that might be worth talking to um, as you're figuring out what your finances are gonna be. It's a free service where basically there are financial planners who can help people access, access good, good fiscal plans for themselves. That's wonderful. I, I, you know, so I work in the, the Denver office and I'm not honestly aware enough of, of individual programs like that in, in Boulder County anymore. So thank you, Brett. I didn't realize that was there, but that's an excellent Yeah, you're resource. welcome. I think it's, it's a pretty unique program and I don't know that it's available in other parts of the state, but I know our, our county government, uh, particularly with a lot of the financial issues that are happening for, for individuals right now, 
uh, they've been pushing that pretty hard and I've chatted a little bit with some of their their staff and they're really fantastic. So I've heard really good things. So Brett, Kathleen's asking for the name of that program. Uh, I will post that as well as a link to that in the chat. Okay. And then Mark is asking if there's an online resource to discover your, your, your particular circumstances. Um, so that's going to be the My Social Security account. What you'll need to do is, is go to ssa.gov, and I'll have a link to that later in my presentation. Um, but you can go in there, and basically it does take a while. You have to give them a lot of personal information, but then you can set up an account and be able to view your, your records. Um, so so that's, that would be the online resource for that. So I just want to touch briefly on the disability um, related programs. Um, so so um, Social Security Disability Insurance um, has both what are called technical requirements and medical requirements, whereas as I've talked about before, Supplemental Security Income has financial and medical requirements. And again, this is the difference between earnings-based and means-based. So Social Security Disability Insurance, your payroll taxes go toward that while you're working, and then when you're disabled, you can claim that. Um, whereas again, Supplemental Security Income is a program for people with limited incomes who maybe don't have enough of a work record to qualify for SSDI. And I do want to talk briefly about a couple of other things. I'm um, working while receiving benefits, which is something I've seen come up in my office, and then also overpayments, which is a lot of the work I do in my office. So Social Security um, Disability insurance, I want to talk about the, the technical requirements first. So you have to be both fully insured and currently insured. And what fully insured means um, is that you've paid in enough. Again, it's that, you know, that 40 work credits. You know, I usually tell people they have to have worked for about 10 years um, to have enough, uh, enough credits to, to be eligible for SSDI. Now, currently insured, and this is where things are a little bit different from retirement, because um, the, the work credits for Social Security Disability Insurance actually expire. If you've been out of work for about five or 10 years, um, what'll happen is that you'll, you'll hit what's called your date last insured. And if you become disabled after that point, you would no longer be eligible for SSDI. That doesn't mean you wouldn't be eligible for SSI and that you wouldn't get any disability benefit. It's just that that SSDI um, benefit eventually expires. So I have people tell me a lot, you know, I used to be a social security disability attorney, like Brett said. And so I would have clients say, you know, how can I not have social security? I worked for, for, you know, for 30 years. And I would have to tell them, yeah, but you've been trying to get on disability for 15 years. And so basically that SSDI benefit has run out now. Um, so that's a very technical medical definition, um, which I'm going to break down a little bit, a little bit later. Um, but basically, it's uh, the definition of disability is the inability to do any substantial gainful activity by reason of any medically determinable physical or mental impairment, which can be expected to result in death or which has lasted or can be expected to last for a continuous period of not less than 12 months. So I'm going to go ahead and break that down because that's a lot of legal ease. And what that basically, what Social Security has done is taken that basically chunk of words and turned it into what's called the sequential um, evaluation process, which is a five-step process that I'm going to show you on my next slide. So step one, is the person doing what's called substantial gainful activity? So what that means is you have to be working above a certain threshold. And I believe this year it's around $1,200 a month. So if you're making more than $1,200 a month, um, Social Security is going to say you're working too much to qualify for benefits, you're automatically denied. If you're not working or you're working below that SGA threshold, then they go on to step two. Do you have a severe impairment? And how they define that is anything that has more than a minimal effect on your ability to work. So that's usually a fairly easy bar to clear. Um, and what that would involve is basically providing medical records to the Social Security Administration to show, yes, I have these medical problems and that's why I can't work. Um, again, if you, if you don't have a severe impairment or Social Security determines that you don't have a severe impairment, that's an automatic denial. If not, you move on to the next step of the process. Does the impairment 
meet or equal a listing. And what that, that's a reference to the medical listings. And what the listings are is basically depending on your problem and they have a, a, a group of listings for each basically body system. So they have one for the cardiovascular system, one for the pulmonary system, one for the skeletal system, one for the nervous system. And they have basically these criteria that they've set up and they also have listings for mental health where if your doctor says you meet these specific benchmarks, you're disabled, end of story. This is the only place where you get that automatic approval instead of the automatic denial. And because what Social Security has basically said is, we don't care what your work history is, we don't care how old you are, we don't care what your education level is. If you, if you have certain impairments, if you're, for example, if, you're, if your heart is damaged enough or if your lungs are damaged enough, or if you have a certain severity of schizophrenia, you just can't work. We've just made the decision, if you're that sick, you can't work, we're just gonna give you benefits. So that's what meeting a listing is. And then if you don't meet a listing, then you go to step four and five, which looks at, and this is where they bring in um, age, education, and work experience. So based on your age and education and work experience, can you do any of the jobs you've done in the past? If you can, then you're not disabled. If you can't, then they actually go to this step five, which says, can you do any work that's available? Their definition is available in, in, I wanna say substantial numbers in the US economy. And so that's when they look at how old are you? The older you are, the more likely you are to be disabled. What's your educational level? The less education you have, obviously the fewer jobs that you qualify for, and so the more likely you are to be disabled. And then they look at, you know, what, what kind of work have you done in the past? Um, and, and what kind of work would that qualify you for in the future? So there is a little bit of a step, what I would call 3.5, which is residual functional capacity. And so what that is, is basically Social Security evaluating you based on your medical records. How long can you sit? How long can you stand? How much can you lift? If you have mental challenges, how long can you spend time around other people? How well can you deal with a supervisor? Things like that. So they determine that residual functional capacity and then they take it into these next two questions. So let's say they decide you have severe problems and you can't do any work above a sedentary level and they determine that all of your past work is at a light level. Well, at that point, they would say you're disabled and go on to the next, or they would say you're, um, they would say that your impairment does not allow for your past relevant work because your past work is a higher exertional level than your current capacity. And so that's when they go to step five. And then they would look at the jobs that would be available for someone your age in your, basically in your RFC category. Um, and I can, and I can actually pause for if there's any questions there, because I know sequential evaluation is really confusing. Um, so I'm going to just take a quick pause and see if anyone has any questions on that. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna keep going, but please feel free to keep your, your questions coming. Um, okay, I do have one. Okay, can I clarify about the timing and what it means to be currently insured? So, um, so again, what that basically boils down to is after a certain number of years of not working, your, um, your, your social security disability benefits expire. So usually the timing for that is between five and 10 years. The first job I had in social security, we would always ask people when we were screening them, um, have you worked in the last 10 years? And if they said no, um, basically the, at that time we didn't take SS, in that company rather, we didn't take SSI only cases. So if a client said, you know, I haven't worked in 15 or 20 years, we would tell them we can't take your case because it's been too long since you've worked, you're no longer eligible for SSDI. So the timing, I would say, you know, in that company I used 10 years, but since then I've really looked at it and it's, you know, it's usually closer to five years. Once you've been out of the workforce for five years, it's a lot harder to get that, that, um, that currently insured status. Oh, okay. So, so Kathleen is asking about COBRA. So there's a difference between di disability insurance and health insurance. So you're on COBRA because you left your job. That's health insurance. 
What that does is obviously pay for your doctors and pay for things like that. The kind of insurance I'm talking about is specifically social security disability insurance. And, and that term, that's the term that we use for the benefits that you pay into the disability, the, the disability benefits that we pay into. So that's its own kind of insurance program. It's not health insurance. Um, if you're on disabled, if disability for two years, you get Medicare, but that's a separate program. So your COBRA, your COBRA has nothing to do with your eligibility for SSDI. And if you're, um, and so Kathleen, if you just stopped working last year, um, depending again on, on how much you paid in, I would think that your, um, if you just stopped working last year, your SSDI would probably still be active. Assuming that you are fully insured, in other words, you paid in enough um, to be eligible. So I would encourage you to go ahead, Kathleen, and apply and, and find out um, because that, that COBRA isn't, yeah, that, okay, good. That COBRA isn't gonna affect your eligibility for SSDI because it's a completely different program. That, that's a good point. You know, when you hear health insurance, when you hear insurance, everyone thinks about health insurance. So I'm glad Kathleen um, had me make that clarification. Um, SSDI is not health insurance. It's basically insurance against going broke if you become disabled. Think of it that way. Um, like I said, after two years of being on SSDI, you get Medicare. That's the, that's the health insurance that comes with SSDI. But SSDI is not in itself health insurance. So um, really quickly, because we've talked about this a little bit in the retirement context, I just want to go over SSI. Um, again, the technical eligibility in that case. Um, Kathleen's comment is I was interpreting fully insured literally that I didn't have any insurance COBRA or anything. I couldn't get SSDI. Yeah, that's what I said. That that word insurance um, in in everybody but public benefits lawyers thinks of that as health insurance. So again, I'm really glad Kathleen had me make that clarification. Um, that's just, you know, uh, think of it as sort of a term of art. You know, this is a different kind of, of insurance. So um, again, you're going to be looking at those those same income and resource requirements that we talked about earlier um, for, for supplemental security income. So you're gonna be um, basically uh, $783 for an individual, $1175 for a couple. Now, since we've been talking a little bit about things that are or are not fair, you'll notice that, that 783 times two is not 1175 they actually uh, dock you a little bit for being uh, married, which again, makes no sense. And, you know, someone needs to look into that as well. Um, and there are certain categories of income that are exempt. Um, now the resource limits here are key. So like I said before, this is a means-based program. This is based on whether or not you need help paying, um, paying your bills. Because again, this is for someone who doesn't have enough work record to have quote unquote earned it. And so, and I, you know, I, I don't want to use that term because I, I frankly think these things should be fundamental human rights, but that's kind of how the system looks at it. Um, so, so you can only have, if you're a person, an individual person, you can only have $2,000. Um, for a couple, it's $3,000. Again, you're getting docked for being in a relationship for or for being married which again is ridiculous but that's how they do it um now exempt resources i do want to spend a little bit of time because i'm sure you guys are thinking oh my god i own a house i have a car you know i'm way over two thousand dollars that, that's not how it works you're allowed so there are certain resources they don't count for ssi eligibility they don't count your house they don't count as if you have one car if you have one car you're allowed to have one car for transportation um, there, are, those are those are the main two that I see. Um, people have questions about. Um, there are also allowances for certain kinds of burial expenses. Um, let's say you have a, a burial plot. A lot of times that won't count against you. Um, just certain other things, and I can go into that more if folks need me to. But I did just want to emphasize that that you know if if it was a straight two thousand, almost no one would qualify for it. 
so they do make certain they do make certain deductions so and i've kind of touched on this already with supplemental security income but if you're not disabled um, I want to talk about the, the kind of what I call the non-technical or the medical and age requirements. So if you're not disabled, you have to be 65 or over to get SSI. If you are disabled, it's going to be that same sequential evaluation process that we talked about earlier. You know, can you work? Do you have a severe impairment? Do you meet a listing? Can you do your past work? Can you do any other work? So that's going to that's going to work the same way. Um, I'm just going to go over this. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go over this a little bit briefly. Um, if you're on disability benefits, either SSDI or SSI, and you try to work, um, basically there's going to be a, a dollar limit that you can earn to keep your benefits. Now, you can work over that certain amount for nine months in a three-year period. That's called a trial work period. They're basically saying, okay, we're going to get, let you keep getting benefits for nine months, even though you're working over the limit, so you can see if you can go back to work or not. Now, this is a little bit tricky because, <clears throat> pardon me, um, because the months don't have to be consecutive. I had a client who worked, you know, several months and then stopped working for, for several years, and then the second she worked that nine month, her trial work period kicked in, um, and she ended up um, basically getting kicked off benefits. So be very cognizant of, of how much you're of how much you're making and make sure that if you are working, you're reporting your earnings to the Social Security Administration. Um, because failure to do that can actually lead to overpayments, which I'll talk about later. Um, so after that ninth month, if you continue to work over the, the dollar limit, which by the way tends to be lower than SGA, it's usually, I think I want to say around $800. Um, the extended period of eligibility starts. And basically that's a 36 month, so it's a, a three year period, where if, you, if you're still working that amount, but then you stop working, you would be eligible for what's called expedited reinstatement. So what would happen is, let's say you, you know, you've been working for two years. So you've got your nine month trial work period, and then you've been working for 13 more, um, Sorry, I'm having trouble doing math. No, that is right. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do math in my head. Um, so you've been working for these 13 more months, and let's say that you know something happens and you can't do it anymore. It just gets too hard. Your disabilities become more severe and you can't do it anymore. So at that point, you would want to apply for expedited reinstatement because you're still within that 36 month window. And what that would basically mean is you wouldn't have to go through the medical evaluation process again. You just tell them, hey, I've stopped working. I can show you that I've stopped working. And then they would basically turn your disability benefits back on. Sorry, so I got a little bit ahead of myself. So if you're below SGA, which is again, that higher threshold, you will get your benefits during that period. If you're at or above SGA, you won't get benefits. Um, but this is where but this is where I was talking about something that happened with my previous client. So once you hit that 37th month, if you're even one month over SGA, then what? Uh, if you work even one month over SGA, then you'll lose your benefits and you'll have to start from scratch. And that's why I made that point about it lying dormant because these months aren't always consecutive. Again, my client's trial work period happened in, I wanna say the early 2000s and she came to me in 2019 and said they're shutting off my benefits because I worked one month too many. So you just, you really have to keep an eye on your earnings. Now, before I go on to overpayments, are there any questions? And I know we're getting close to the end of time, Brett, so I just wanted to pause for one second. Okay, hearing no questions, I'm just going to finish this up very quickly by talking about overpayments. Um, so what an overpayment is, is if Social Security says, we paid you benefits you weren't entitled to, you have to give those back now. That's, that's very broadly how, I how, how that's defined. Um, the causes can be, if you, like I said before, if you're working while you're receiving benefits and, so, and you don't tell Social Security, you can get hit with an overpayment. Um, Again, failure to 
report information timely to the Social Security Administration. And that could be an increase in it be if you're on SSI and let's say you win the lottery, you know, and you don't report that um, and they keep paying you SSI because that's a means based program and your resources are now too high. Um, things like that would, would could trigger an overpayment. But I do want to mark these 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 last two here because errors and slow press processing times at SSA because it's not always your fault. There have been cases where you know Social Security. One of the cases I had, um, basically, the client reported her marriage right after she got married, and she was in a situation where getting married would make her ineligible. And she gave them her marriage certificate two days after she got married, and they didn't process it for several years. And so she ended up with a very large overpayment. And one of the things that I was arguing to Social Security is, hey, this isn't her fault because um, this isn't her fault because um, basically she did everything she was supposed to do. You guys just didn't process it timely. Hang on, I just want to look at this question here. Okay. Okay. So, so looking at that, um, if you're born in 19, and let me just read the question for folks. If, if I'm born in 1956, um, then 66.4 is my eligible age. If I apply for SSA, for Social Security at 64, would it help me to wait until 64.4? So the short answer is yes, but not that much. So it's going to be staggered. The earlier you apply for benefits, the lower that monthly benefit's going to be. So if your, your age is 64.4 and you apply at 66, it'll be a little bit reduced. If you apply at 64.4, it'll be, be more reduced. And if you apply at 64.4, or rather at 64.4, it's just at 64, it'll be even more reduced. So that would probably be a marginal help to you, um, but it's not the, it's not, it, it would still, um, it would still reduce your benefits. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so I didn't put in here very much about remedies for waivers because that's something I deal with more in, in the public benefits context. But if you do, if you are accused of an overpayment, um, the first thing you're probably going to want to do is honestly call legal services because I know the, the Boulder offices, the Boulder office does have lawyers who can help you sort out a social security overpayment. But you're either, if you don't think you are overpaid, you're going to want to appeal the overpayment. And if you think you are overpaid, but you can't afford to pay it back, you can ask for a waiver. And that's where that issue of fault comes in. So if you reported everything you were supposed to, and Social Security doesn't process it for 10 years, and then says you have an overpayment, even though you technically may owe that overpayment, you can basically say, this overpayment wasn't my fault. I reported everything I was supposed to, and I can't afford to pay it back. And sometimes in that situation, Social Security will waive the overpayment. They'll say you don't have to pay it back. You can also, um, if you're, you know, if you're having income issues, you can also request a lower uh, monthly payment. Can I only pay $10 a month? Can I only pay $20 a month? Um, and that would depend on your income and resources. But if you get an overpayment notice, it's always a good idea to contact your local legal aid office. So just practical tips for working with SSA. I'm going to, and I put this one at the top and I know I've said it a couple times, report everything as soon as possible. If you get married, if your income goes up, if you start working, if you stop working, any major changes you're going to want to report to Social Security. Um, and make sure that you, if you, you know, it's always better to, to do these things in writing. Um, and if you do call them on the phone, um, make sure you're actually writing down who you talked to, what day it was, what time you called in. Because again, if you do hit, get hit with an overpayment down the line, and you can say, hey, I talked to Jill, I called Social Security and I talked to Jill on, you know, September 4th at 3 p.m. and she told me they were going to put this information in the system, then you have a much stronger case to say, you know, I reported this timely, you guys shouldn't make me pay back this overpayment. Um, you know, everyone, everyone has probably seen the, the national Social Security number, which I don't have on this slide, but it's 800. 772-1213. Again, that's 800-772-1213.
but that's not always the best number because that, that's the national number and their information can be very um, very generalized and they probably don't have a lot of case specific information. You know, I've had people who've called that number and then called their local office tell me they got two different answers to the same question. So the best way to do that is always to call your local office directly if you need to talk to, to, to Social Security. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, you can't go in in person, um, but you can call them. And there's a website that's ssa.gov slash locator. And what you do is you basically put your zip code into that and they'll tell you what, their, what the local office, um, what local office you need to be communicating with. Now, one of my old pet peeves for that website is that it didn't have the phone number of your local office, but now it does. I don't know if this is something they started during COVID. That's when I started noticing it. You can actually get the phone number, the fax number, and the address of your local office um, on this website, ssa.gov slash locator. Um, another thing I would say, if you talk to someone um, and they are able to help you, you know, and, and they are the person assigned to your case and they're able to help you, I would go ahead and say, what is your direct extension? Um, because a lot of times you'll get people who are just looking in your file who aren't familiar with your case. And so again, you might not get as good of an answer from those folks. So if you find someone you can work with, you know, say, hey, what is your extension? Um, so I can talk to you about this directly. Now they may or may not give it out, but that's a good, if you found someone that you can work with, it's always worth asking. Um, now the one caveat I would say to that is that it can take them a long time to return voicemails. Social Security is incredibly understaffed, um, incredibly overburdened, and so it can take them a long time to respond to voicemails. Um, it can take them a long time to process documents. That's how overpayments happen. Um, but trying to get, get like a point person at Social Security can be helpful. And then I mentioned this in the comments earlier, but you, would, but you do want to sign up for the My Social Security account. Um, you can just go to Social Security's website, which is ssa.gov, um, and do that. And that'll give you um, basically online information to all the online access rather to all the information about your case. And then this is my last practice tip for dealing with Social Security, and that's repetition and patience. Um, I said, you know, if you don't succeed, try, try again. And the reason I say that is, like I said before, you know, you may call them every day for five days and not be able to talk to somebody and then on the sixth day you can get someone on the phone. I guess that doesn't make sense because it well, we'll say business days. Um, you know the sixth day you finally get someone on the phone. You know you can send in the same if they tell you you know we need this document and you say well I've already sent it in three times just send it in again because they do lose paperwork. They, they do have a lot of trouble managing the documents that they get. So just keep sending things in you know so you know, and basically being, you know, kind of the squeaky wheel. If there's an issue, just following up with them until you get it resolved um, is really important when you're dealing with Social Security. So I just wanted to put up these resource slides and I won't stay on them very long, um, but we have the regulations um, available at this website. Um, we have the what are called the program operations, basically the program operations manual which is basically the Bible for Social Security employees. It's what they look at when they're trying to make decisions. Um, and that's at, the, at, at this website. Um, and so that, that's one place you can go for more information about Social Security. Um, I did just want to put on the last slide and I'm, and Brett, I hope you're okay with this. Um, I, oh yeah, please. Okay. Um, because the first, so, so as far as, as individual resources that aren't just reading through regulations, um, for you guys, Boulder County Legal Services is going to be your best uh, contact, 303-449-7575, um, because you guys are in Boulder County. If you know someone outside Boulder County who has a social security issue or other, or other public benefits issue, or honestly, uh, most other civil legal issues as well, they can call that second number, the, the statewide intake, and talk to us at Colorado Legal Services. And then I did just put my personal contact information up. Unfortunately, my office does not take Boulder County cases. I'm situated in, um, I'm situated in the Denver office, but I did just want to um, make my information available for anyone who has follow-up questions.
So thank you guys for your attention. Okay, I lied, there is a piece of cheese at the end of the maze. But, but I think that's actually, you know, I, I did that when I first put this presentation together, I did that to be funny. But I think that really kind of goes to my persistence comment. If you can navigate the maze and you can be persistent enough, you can get your piece of cheese, which is, you know, income to live on, health insurance. So some would say that was is probably even better than cheese. So um, I know I took questions during the presentation, but I want to thank you guys for your time. And I know we're running a little bit over, but I did just want to open it up one more time for any questions I haven't answered. Okay, hearing and seeing nothing. I just want to thank you guys again for your attention and wish you a good rest of your day and stay safe. Great. Well, thank you so much, Erin. Um, and if you stop your screen share, I can share our sponsor slide once more just to say thank you to those folks. Um, it should be gone now. We really do. Yes. Yeah. We really, really do um, appreciate um, all of all of your time and especially staying over answering answering all the questions that came in um, and really appreciate your your willingness to to share your your information oh and we are having um one more request for your direct line i'm going to type the answer real quick um but if you would read that out loud again aaron yeah, so let me give you my number one more time. It's 303-866-9391. Um, and it looks like the rest of these questions would be more for, for you, Brett. Yes, these are from prior presentations. Um, so if uh, the speaker from the prior week provided, um, their, what's the best way to talk to someone about a previous presentation? Um, so if the speaker of that presentation provided their information in their talk, um, probably the best way is to follow up with them directly. Um, if you've forgotten the information, you can always, um, look at the video once that's posted uh, and see if that's in there. Um, another alternative would be to um, search uh, Boulder County Bar Association's directory um, or search directly for that uh, presentation. Um, and I do see, um, I will follow up with just uh, answering via typing it in who that, that speaker was. So I went ahead um, and sent you that uh, that attorney's name and their firm. Um, did that answer the question that you had um, asked last week, or was it more specific? Um, okay. Well, if, if not, please feel free to um, email the info. It might just take us a little while. Um, our planning committee is all made up of, of those of us with other jobs, so it does take a little, little time um, to answer those questions. Um, so we, will, we do get to, to questions that are submitted to, to our website. Again, we're just working full-time jobs as well, so we apologize for any delays. Um, but uh, thank you so much. I think we're gonna go ahead and end. Um, I'll stop my share and, and thank you everyone for your time. Um, oh, and we did have a question about PDF, getting copies of the PDF. Um, so Erin, would you mind, uh, if you would email those to me and um, the person who asked the question, if you can send that 
to um, send that request to the the um, sorry to the uh, the contact information for for Senior Law Day. We can get that to you. Uh, we're just going to ask that you you send us an email to request that. Yeah, Brett, I'll definitely send you basically the the PDF version of this presentation today. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And on that note, everyone, I hope you have a good rest of your day. And um, thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, guys.